Hello, good evening and welcome and thank you very much for coming to the Institute for Government at this slightly earlier time than we usually do our events. Uh, this, as you can uh, see, is a very popular event because if you just put the hashtag Yellowhammer on anything, everybody gets very excited. But possibly we might be about to discover, are they getting too overexcited? So I'm, uh, we're going to discuss that for the next, uh, next hour or so. Uh, just to introduce the panel we have assembled, uh, on my immediate right we have Ros Irwin. Ros is uh, at the Sunday Times and Ros is notable for the person whose byline was all over the big yellow hammer splash that came out uh, inconveniently while I was on holiday, but, uh, but she sort of got hold of the documents and I managed to turn five pages of documents into probably even more of that uh, of news coverage. So. Well done, Roz. So she's going to tell us a bit about, uh, about actually what's in it. Then I'm delighted, uh, I'm going to introduce my speakers in the order, I'm going to ask them questions. So this will be a revelation to them too. Uh, Philip Rycroft. Philip stood down in March uh, of this year as the Permanent Secretary of the Department for Exiting the EU. So while not privy to the latest mm -hmm. version of government conditions planning, he was of course abs at the absolute epicentre of the government planning for the last time we thought we might leave the mm. EU with no deal uh, in the 29th of March. So he had gone by the time we might have left the EU with no deal on the 13th of April. So uh, Philip will be there to actually tell us how these sorts of plans are used in government. Then on my right, I have Graham Gudgeon, Chief Economist at Policy Exchange. Um, Graham, I think it's fair to say, is one of the Yellowhammer sceptics and has written rather coruscating denunciation of Yellowhammer in The Spectator, describing it as another outing for Project Fear, uh, Project Fear 2.0. Uh, but at the same time, he also thinks there's a very good, strong case for greater transparency about these sorts of plans. So we'll be hearing from Graham. Then I'm absolutely delighted, uh, particularly when he gets his voice back, that we're joined by the chair of the Exiting the EU Committee, Hilary Benn, right on Hilary Benn MP, seen on our platforms before. Uh, Hilary, of course, would be grilling Michael Gove about this document. Uh, were Parliament sitting, uh, may have the opportunity next week, uh, if uh, the Supreme Court judgment goes one way, when we get it, or may not have that opportunity, has, I think, in any case, written to Michael Gove, possibly offering him uh, the chance to, uh, chance to come along and explain, but we'll be hearing a bit more about uh, about actually the view the exiting the EU committee will take about these documents and some of the hearings they've been doing on no deal planning and, uh, and holding the government to account for this. And then on my far left, and to sort of fill in the gaps left by any of this other comprehensive panel, <laughs> is my excellent programme director colleague, Joe Owen. And Joe has spent the last uh, couple of years at the Institute for Government getting to grips with the minutiae of uh, implementing Brexit, customs, migration, no deal planning, and what it means for Whitehall. So that's our panel. Uh, we're going to have a bit of a chat, and then we're going to have opportunities for all of you to ask your questions. And if anyone is in the next door room, and I'm forecasting and contingency planning that there probably are people in the next door room. So the mitigation I'm putting in place is if you are in the next door room and want to ask a question, make sure that when we get to questions you put your head around the door and indicate that, otherwise you'll be ignored. Anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to set off first with Roz. Um, so Roz, tell us you know, what's in these documents and why you actually thought it was really worthwhile uh, taking a sort of slightly dull planning document when government some might see it sort of a central part of government business and making it a rather big front page <laughs> splash so what is interesting about yellow hammer well, we actually got the first five pages of the paper out of it which to be fair is not obviously my decision that's the editor's decision um, but naturally one supports one story's getting prominence in a paper so i i won't complain about that um clearly um so we felt that the public did not know enough of what a no-deal Brexit looked like and what was being planned for. And I think that there was a perception, and I've, I've heard MPs say this, uh, that uh, if we were going to have a general election, we were faced, well, what the po population was facing was an unknown, potentially a no-deal Brexit, versus a known 
relatively known quantity in Jeremy Corbyn, and, and, and clearly uh, it is fair that people know what, what they are facing. Um, obviously, uh, things have rather changed since August the 18th, and, uh, 18th in terms of um, uh, the political situation, but it did feel that they were potentially offering us an election at a time when we didn't understand what that was. Um, and I don't think it's a dull planning document. I mean, it's written in a very dull way, which isn't very surprising, perhaps. But I don't think it's dull. I mean, I, I, the, when I first read it, I, I was particularly horrified about the bit around Northern Ireland, um, given that at each point we have been told by the government that we will not have a hard border in Northern Ireland. And it very clearly states that it expects the uh, prospect of... Um, no checks on the border and, and, and the possibility of having a, an open border to, to collapse very quickly. Um, now, obviously, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a reporter here, so it's not my job to have an opinion on this, but what we have done here is reproduce what is in the document. And obviously, what was then published was pretty much what we had published. Um, and that only happened because of us putting this document into the public eye. Uh, I, I might add that people could scrutinise the fact that what has since been published is essentially exactly what we published with one part redacted and a different headline on it, uh, a, different topic, uh, a different top. And that they might say, well, what about everything else? This is a relatively short planning assumptions document. Uh, I think the FT has since got hold of a, a, a bit of the transport stuff, but there is an awful lot more that we still do not know. Um, and people might push for more clarity on that. You know, this is a sort of document, it's relatively, re government does contingency planning, it draws up <coughs> risk registers in order to identify possibilities. So actually, how is this sort of document used and what's the purpose of it? And, you know, Rosa said this is a bit of a tip of an iceberg, so what lies beneath? So let me distinguish uh, two things. First of all, distinguish the planning from the mm -hmm. policy intent. So what you have in front of you is the publicly expressed fruits, if you like, a huge amount of work's mm. gone on in government on Yellowhammer contingency planning in particular. Uh, clearly that's a job that was civil servants were tasked to do, and you see the fruits of that work that is distinct from the policy around whether mm. we get a deal or not. So just make that distinction clear. It's also worth making a distinction between the Yellowhammer work and the underlying no deal planning work. So Yellowhammer does what it says on the tin, it's contingency mm. planning. Uh, there has been a huge amount of work going on across government uh, uh, for over three years now on no deal planning and indeed deal planning generally. The famous 300 or so work streams which Hillary and his committee and the PAC used to grill me on from time to time, um, which, which have looked across all of the domains of policy that are impacted um, uh, by Brexit deal or no deal. I could read you out a list, but you get the no. thought, you get, you, well, I think it's the 300 <laughs> long list, I won't read you out, but um, a lot of that stuff on that list does not appear on Yellowhammer mm. um, contingency, mm. but it doesn't need to, so um, somebody somewhere in government is thinking about what you do with the Erasmus programmes, but that's mm. not going to appear on, on Yellowhammer. Mm. Somebody's thinking about um, uh, cultural agreements. Mm. Um, other stuff, for example, uh, Brits in EU, certainly the border mm. and so on, obviously does come into mm. Yellowhammer. So what does Yellowhammer do? Essentially, Yellowhammer picks up um, in the circumstances where those mainstream plans mm. don't work out. Mm. And just to give one a very straightforward example, mm. which is more or less public mm. domain, um, the border. Mm. Um, if there are plans to deal with the border, uh, those plans aim very to... Sure. Let's just, just to, again, just to recap, distinguish between the plans and the policy. So if you're looking at Yellowhammer plans or indeed other no-deal planning, distinguish between that and the policy intent. These are two different things. Civil services tasked to do a job of planning. Civil services, in my view, I was responsible for quite a lot of it for a while, so I would say this, but has, I think, executed that responsibility um, uh, extremely well. Uh, it's been tested uh, very thoroughly um, uh, by select committees and others uh, when they're there, and I think um, generally passed muster. Um, Yellowhammer itself, its relationship to the broader planning that's been going on in government ever since uh, the referendum. Uh, that's where I was talking about the 300 plus work streams which cover the whole domain of policy um, uh, which would be impacted by Brexit in any form, deal or no deal. Obviously that work is focused on no deal almost exclusively since uh, late last year. Um, Yellowhammer relates to that as if you like the, the, the contingency planning held in Yellowhammer, not in this document itself but what underpins this document, 
what kicks in if those plans uh, don't work out as intended. So one very simple example just to illustrate that. Um, the plans uh, aim to ensure the border will function, particularly Dover Calais, um, uh, as, as well as possible, and the traffic will flow. If the traffic doesn't flow, Yellowhammer kicks in. What happens then? That, in that circumstance, you've got Operation Brock. How do you deal with the trucks uh, that need to be managed uh, uh, in Kent until they can get over the short straits crossing? So there is a, a, that's the simplest, and happens to be in the public domain, yeah. illustration of the relationship between No Deal Plan as a whole and Yellowhammer. So Operation Brock is designed to cope with a reduce of flow rate to 40 to 60 percent of current levels which exactly. is the, if that, that's still the assumption and there will be reams and reams of detailed planning how do you manage that what do you say to truckers who are coming mm. into kent at what point do you tell them they have to um uh, park here how do you manage that and, and so on and so forth so all of that stuff um has been thought through in government uh, uh, over the last uh, months and indeed years now right so graham uh, as I mentioned when we started off, it seems like a bit of time ago, um, but when I started off, you're quite sceptical about the, perhaps the quality, the value of this document um, and see it a bit more as a sort of another exercise in scaremongering rather than a sort of essential <coughs> planning tool of the sort that Philip set out. So you want to give us your critique of Yellowhammer? Okay. Um First, let me, let me thank you for inviting me to this. This is Delighted to have you. So, so, something close to my heart. I mean, as a, as, as a Brexiteer, I mean, over the last three years, we've just been faced with a sort of whole series of apoplectic, is that right? No, apocalyptic. No, you, you, apocalyptic. Thank, thank, apocalyptic. Thank you, Ron. I need a journalist by myself to <laughs> keep me right on words. Um, uh, forecasts and predictions, starting with the Treasury during the... Uh, the uh, the referendum campaign. I have to say, I regard the Treasury's role in Brexit as, as little short of a constitutional outrage. We really shouldn't have been allowed to do this. And uh, I, I'm one of the few people in the country, part of a research team, that's actually managed to take apart exactly what they did and find out what the exaggerations were. But here we are with Yellowhammer. Uh, yet again, we have a document which suggests to people that these things might Terrible things might, might happen. We might be short of food. We might be short of, of medicine. <coughs> if, if, I, if I'm on the radio about this, uh, people say, uh, interviewers quite reasonably say to me, but surely you don't want people you know, to be dying in hospital through lack of, you know, of course you don't want people in hospital to be lacking, uh, lacking their medication. So here we have a document. It, it's not factual. It doesn't tell us what's, uh, what's, what's going to happen. It's not about contingency planning. Uh, I take Philip's point that the whole Yellowhammer operation is about contingency planning. And, and I know from talking to some of Philip's former colleagues that a great deal of very valuable and detailed work has been done. But this document isn't that at all. This, 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 this document is just a series of terrible things that might happen. The document is full of woods and coulds. Although, as you read through it towards the end, it, uh, it starts to morph into will. The more will happens and, and less uh, could, could happen. So most of this is about congestion uh, at, uh, at um, the ports up in Kent, what they call the narrow straits. We're really talking about Dover. Um, what, what could go wrong there? The, the assumptions underlying these predictions of shortages of food and, uh, and medicine and so on, are that between 50 and 85% of hauliers won't be ready for French customs, won't, won't have got the right documentation. So the basic idea is they come into Dover, they're put on ferries, they get to Calais. Calais says, oh no, they've got wrong documents, you know, it all piles up at Calais, so we can't, um, ferries can't take any more, uh, so it all piles up at Dover and people can't even uh, get into the port. 50 to 85%. After three months, they say that might have improved to 70%, up to 70%. And after six months, we still have a problem. So after six months, the, the assumption is that UK hauliers, logistics companies, still can't fill in French customs forms. French customs, by the way, have been handing out leaflets to drivers leave, leaving the channel ports for months now, telling them exactly what they have to be ready for. Calais is ready for this. The, um, uh, the uh, chairman of Calais Port, Jean-Marc, if I can pronounce his name correctly, Puissesseau, um, says that Calais is ready. The last thing Calais wants is, 
is, is any holdups that lead to their business being uh, filtered off to other ports like Rotterdam uh, and so on. The regional president of the Calais uh, region, Yves Bertrand, says exactly the same. Um, but none of this seems to matter. N not, none of this comes forward in this, uh, this document. It, it, it just says, well, what would happen if 50 to 85 percent, 85 percent of, of hauliers can't fill in a French uh, customs declaration? And then there's another assumption you, you build on this, which is that the, the UK authorities don't do anything about this. Now, as Philip says, actually, a lot of preparations have been made, like Brock and so on, but none of that is in this document. It just says, well, look, if these lorries pile up and it doesn't really get better over three or six months, then these terrible things could happen. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, it would be terrible if we had an asteroid strike or a tsunami up the Thames or something, you know, I mean, all sorts of terrible things could happen. And, of course, civil servants have to prepare for this. But these are outlandish uh, assumptions. And, of course, in the press... They're taken as predictions. I mean, that's exactly what Joe Swinson said at the Lib Dem conference yesterday. She said these things will happen. It's in a government document. She didn't say that the, you know this is, these are outlandish predictions, very unlikely to, uh, to to happen. And one can ask about civil service. I take the point that this reads like an internal memo that was never. It's it's not particularly well put together or headed. It's not quite obvious what its uh, what its role is. So it's probably never never <coughs> meant for publication or to, to get this far. But the government, I think, firstly, should take precautions because we know the media will take any uh, planning assumption of this sort as something that is likely to happen. That's how it's reported. That's how it's been reported a hundred times, <coughs> thousand, uh, a thousand times since this document, since Ross's great scoop, uh, this, this document appeared. Um, so Graham, is your, I'm interested in this because if you think this, I mean, let's assume this is a document that the government didn't intend to come out, which I think is probably fair, don't know, uh, but let's assume that. Your complaint, presumably then, if you think these are overinflated assumptions, would be that the government therefore will be wasting money by overinvesting in schemes to deal with an implausible flow rate or hiring too much capacity to deal with medicines and stuff. So, so are you suggesting that basically one of the problems for these sorts of slightly exaggerated things, maybe that this is a document that's dated the 2nd of August, new government comes in, uh, civil servants present slightly scary assumptions to ministers and force them to, you know, we've seen two tranches of two billion put in to no deal planning. Does, is your suggestion that this is leading to overspending on no deal planning to mitigate these risks. The that seems to be the logical conclusion of what you're saying. The real point I'm making is that in this particular document, the assumptions are just outlandish. Uh, so it's just uh, extreme, government's not very good at doing that, is your but, like, but that doesn't mean that yeah. nothing, nothing could happen. Yeah. I thought that, that when all this uh, Operation mm. Brock started, mm. that the problem was we didn't know what would happen, what, what, what the French would do. Will the, will the mm. French be very difficult on this? <coughs> but there's no mention of that in this particular document. There it, is it, at the top. Yeah. It says about how uh, we think they're getting more hostile or whatever right at the top of the document. Uh, that, would, that we won't get, you know. Would, would you like to read that bit out? Sorry, I, I don't have it. Yes. I've got the. I think. I, oh, I, okay, don't, don't, don't. I think one of the assumptions actually is one of the changes in assumptions, I think, though um, I won't ask Philip to confirm this, is that actually because Calais is more ready than it was in March, that the <coughs> assumptions of flow have actually improved from yeah. the yeah. March document. C C Cali, Cali clearly says that they're, they're absolutely ready. I mean, we might say they would say that because they don't want their yeah. business to <laughs> disappear to Rotterdam. Um, but but that, that's, that's yeah. what they actually say. The, the, the assumptions that cause all the shortages in here are to do with companies not filling Parts not of this document have got worse, though, between the early iteration of the May, you know, we're going to leave on the 31st of March. I think this is really important to state. There are elements of this document that I know have got worse between March the 31st and August the 2nd when this document and as we kept saying obviously that we were told this was an old document we wrote that that wasn't true uh, but that that lie got repeated over and over again um, we know there are elements of this document that have got worse absolutely the port element has improved 
uh, that is how, incidentally, the BBC could say that this was a current mm. document. Um, they were aware because they'd run a story about a week earlier, they, their economics mm. editor. But it's really important to say that parts of this document look worse than they did in the March version of and it. And part of the problem is the October deadline rather than the March deadline and yes. things about seasonality. Yeah. I, want to bring, I want, just want to bring Joe in here about this point about building in mitigations or whatever and where these are worst case assumptions, where these are just assumptions, assumptions. You know, do you want to just uh, to yes, take us through and then I'll bring Hillary in for... The first quick point I'll make is that there are kind of three bits to yellow hammer. The assumptions are just one. So while it is a less uh, glamorous document, the NAO did a paper in uh, March which set out how government yellow hammer contingency plans worked out. <coughs> the first stage was get a base layer of assumptions, a reasonable worst case, so every department knows what they're working to, which is quite important when you have 20-odd departments and agencies all involved at the border. The next stage of Yellowhammer is work out what your upfront mitigations are. So what can you do between now and the date of exit to try and mitigate against those worst effects? So that's where your operation brock and things come in. And then the third part of Yellowhammer is the operational centres that are being stood up to run eventually, I think, 24-7 for the point at which we leave, which will have thousands of civil servants being dragged from working on, say, aid in DFID to come and man operational centres, a big reorganisation within government, which was a huge task. And that kind of recognises that these are just assumptions. We don't actually know how this is going to play out because there are so many things outside of the UK government's control. So what the French actually do and whether the mm. EU Commission starts mm. saying you need to be applying mm. the letter of the law or actually ease off, that's kind of unknown. Mm. The level of pre trader readiness, also quite unknown, because while government is um, putting out its new communications campaign, these same people <laughs> still read the newspaper and see Parliament's blocking no deal, Boris Johnson saying no deal a million to one. So whether they actually choose to invest is a different question. So there's so many unknowns. On the point about being a reasonable worst case, I think you know, whether it said base scenario or not at the top, it's the civil contingency secretariat. What they do is reasonable worst case. They take the national risk register. They have a set formula for making reasonable worst case. So you can kind of assume that this is similar. But in some cases, as you were saying, Jill, there's a kind of sliding scale, right? So you have to put a number on border flow to come up with a reasonable worst case that is, you can debate it, but ultimately they've gone for something right at the hard end so they know that they're ready. But actually, in some cases, you can be pretty sure this stuff is going to happen. I mean, it says something about the UK will lose access to law enforcement data. It's I mean, happen. not even um, yeah. EEA, yeah. single market members, have access to that unless you're in the Schengen. So you can be pretty sure that is going to happen. It says no data adequacy decision. You can be pretty sure that is going to happen. So while some of it is a reasonable worst case that is there for being ready for the absolute worst, some of it to use the terminology, is probably base case in that it's just a kind of matter of law that these things will happen. Mm. So, Hilary, mm. in your role as chairing the Exiting the EU Committee, you've been taking loads of evidence on this. Um, are you surprised by anything in this document? Um, you know, parliamentarians who got this published, is it helpful to have this in the public domain? Um, and what might you have done with it, actually, if... Um, if you'd been able to get uh, Michael Gove in front of you, um, which obviously at the moment you can't. Well, I was very interested to receive <coughs> five pages in an email on the Wednesday evening, but where's the rest of it? That's my starting point. I mean, the Welsh Government has produced a document of 35 pages, and the UK Government has released five summary pages. Now, as we know from what Philip has said, there's loads of work underpinning it. <coughs> Uh, I'd like to see that. I've written to Michael Gove saying, can we have the rest? Thank you very much. Could you just explain what the difference is between a base scenario and a reasonable worst case scenario? Because it's quite clear that the version mm. that Ros got hold of for the Sunday Times had base scenario on it. And the one that we've got is reasonable worst case scenario. If there's a reasonable best case scenario, can I have a copy, please? Seriously. Mm. Um, that's, I think, the first thing. Secondly, Will Wood might. Fair point, but I think, Joe, you, it's really important that you highlighted what others are going to do. Because we can put all the mitigation we like in place, it's what the French customs official does. 
with their hand and their paperwork on the first day. And yes, it's true, Calais has built 300 spaces in the, um, I think it's <coughs> the yellow or the orange lane, where they're going to put trucks that don't have the right paperwork. But as Michael Gove conceded to me, when they're all full, then the lorries aren't going to be able to come off the ferry, and so the backing up process begins. And it's not just a question of customs declarations. There's lots of other paperwork, depending on what you're carrying. There is the great heat-treated wooden pallet shortage crisis. I questioned him about that. He didn't really seem to know what the answer was. But under EU law, if you're a third country and you're inputting goods into the EU, the pallets on which you carry the goods have to be heat-treated to prevent the transfer of nasty bugs, beetles and other diseases from entering the European Union. We took evidence in which the road transport folks said, yep, there's a shortage of pallets. So what's going to happen on uh, that front? The Welsh document I read, um, it says, pressing the UK government for a strong interventionist approach to provide financial support which is sufficient, reasonable, proportionate, mm -hmm. rather than relying on the market to adjust as firms fail. Or this wonderful one, a grant has been awarded to the DPJ mm -hmm. Foundation to extend its existing one-to-one -one counselling this is talking about farmers, because one thing that's definitely going to happen is the tariffs are going to be applied. There's no would, could about it. It will happen. And if you're a sheep farmer, you're in big, big trouble if you're facing a tariff of between 40 and 50%. The grant will support free mental health training to vets and feed firms so they can signpost farmers to the best source of support. And the final point I want to make is this. I have to pinch myself, and I hope the audience, all of you here, have to pinch yourselves. We're sitting here discussing, as a matter of government policy, a course of action that could do all these things to our economy and our businesses. And if those who say it's all fake news, all I plead with you is, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Because you need to be really, really confident that you're wrong if that's a risk that you are prepared to take. And I can think of no previous example in my lifetime where a government has advocated a policy that they know is going to cause damage to the country, to the economy and to businesses, which is why a lot of very able civil servants have spent so much time preparing for the consequences of what I regard to be the government's own folly. So, Philip, um, just sort of last comment. I mean, I'm just sort of quite interested. I think one of the things Graham has argued for is that actually there should be more transparency about some of these assumptions. That actually, we should be prepared to put these things into the public domain. Actually, that's a sort of bit of an <coughs> aid to planning. Um, but clearly, you know, it's quite difficult for the public to distinguish between, you know, worst, reasonable worst mm. case or even base case planning assumptions and forecast predictions. You know, what's the, you know, have you taken any lessons out of this about the difficulties of sort of managing these sort of, you know, really unforecastable risks yeah, in some ways? I think it's a very fair point of the government trying to find that right balance, if you like, mm. between um, uh, informing the public yeah. about what, where the things are going, the sort of planning that's been done, and not um, exciting, exaggerated mm. fears about what might happen. And actually, this has been a feature as the IFG mm. when you did your mm. work on Brexit planning mm. some about a mm. year ago, critical of the government for not putting more mm. into the public domain, um, not just on no deal mm. planning, but a whole bunch mm. of other stuff as well. Uh, when you're sitting in government dealing with this, actually the fact that things are hidden from you doesn't necessarily help in mm. terms of the interaction mm. with the people you need to talk to uh, who are impacted by all this. The other thing I would say is that when the government does put some stuff out sort of uh, voluntarily or actually under mm. some uh, compulsion occasion as well, <laughs> it doesn't always get the sort of publicity mm. this gets, but actually the material in it gives you some very good clues about what's going on. So I refer to the document that was published in response to the, uh, the, the possibility of the humble address from Anna Subri back in mm. February mm. this year, which is more than five pages long and sets mm. out, I have it here, mm. in some detail, the implications for business mm. and trade of a no-deal exit on 29th March 2019. Didn't get anything like the same publicity <coughs> that the Yellowhammer document uh, got, but it did set out um, in a very straightforward mm. way, all of the risks that the government felt it was dealing with. I think the final thing I'd say is you can, of course you can argue mm. about the framing of mm. a reasonable worst mm. case scenario. And these things are judgments, that this mm. is not an absolute, because we do not know what will happen, particularly on the border. Joe's quite right, mm. some things we do mm. know happen. 
uh, uh, data, for example, uh, we come out of data adequacy. Businesses need to be ready for that. They need to have their legal conditions and contracts in place mm -hmm. in order to import data from uh, the EU. We know we come out of security databases, so uh, the, the security agencies and the police mm -hmm. need to know what their workarounds are for all of that. On the border, because of those dependencies, trader readiness, mm -hmm. uh, the response mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the French and other authorities, you've got a range of possible outcomes and responsible planning takes you to the reasonable worst case end of those scenarios so you have the plans in place to deal with that uh, so i think from my perspective the work that we did in government when i was part of government and what i see has been done since i left is i say civil servants acting responsibly under instruction and ministers to put in place the plans that might be necessary I'd frankly far rather be criticised for getting erring on the side of caution uh, than erring on the side of, of not having adequate plans in place. And I think on that basis, if I could just say one final word, I think the civil service in sticking uh, with this through thick and thin, uh, making sure that ministers have before them properly evidenced uh, uh, arguments about where the risks lie and that has been something that the civil service has worked hard on uh, and properly on uh, over my time and I've no doubt since then as well. But, but Philip, you, you would concede there's virtually no evidence in this particular paper. No, this, this, this particular paper, of course not, is a, is a five-page summary um, of the, the uh, of if you like, the, whether you call it the base case, the worst case, or the reasonable worst case, I think we're probably into semantics around all of that. Um, but the, this is based on the work that has been done to look at what the possibilities are uh, in order to inform, as Joe's described it, the planning, the mitigations that might have to be put in place. Uh, and uh, that has been the subject of a lot of work over time, and it's shifted. So, uh, as, as has been already mentioned, um, because we know more about what the French authorities might be doing or have done or would do, that has changed some of the assumptions around uh, the, the handling of the border there. Other things have changed in other directions, so October isn't a great time of year, it's not a great time of year for fresh, we're more dependent on imports of fresh fruit and veg from the EU. It also happens to be the running, the most critical time of year for retailers, as they stock up for Christmas, the most important time of year for retail. So warehouse space is constrained for those who wish to stockpile. I think the other thing is just worth pointing out, if you're looking at this from a business perspective, and we forget there are hundreds of thousands of business worrying about this stuff, that they've already had to gear up for a March uh, possible no deal, already had to gear up for an April possible no deal. Um, the, the lack of clarity of the political messaging makes it really, really tough for businesses who have to undergo their own planning. It's hard, it's difficult, it's complicated, it costs money. Um, and I think we ought to just spare a thought uh, to all those businesses um, who are looking at this thinking, what do I do? How much resource do I commit for an outcome that may or may not happen? So, Philip, if I read the government website, it tells me the government, the UK will be leaving on the 31st of October, notwithstanding the uh, Ben Burt bill, or Ben Bill, or whatever, Ben Act, which uh, went through, which said that we, yeah, and that's all about no deal planning. None of it's about deal planning. It's all about no deal planning. Are you comfortable with the government website still saying that if you were still a permanent secretary? Uh, that's a good question. I think the uh, if you you've got to you've got to again the government's a bit caught on this one, isn't it? Because you uh, there has been so much mixed messaging. We know that trader readiness. If you look at the some of the indicators, uh, and I know now you're in numbers the uh, economic operator. Registration and identification numbers that you need in order to export anywhere in the world. That's, and if you've only exported to the EU, you need to get one of these things that have now been allocated. Um, but if, the, if you're worried about trader readiness, you've got to try and persuade traders to go through the pain barrier to get themselves prepared for this. And the advantage <coughs> of that, of course, then, if we are in a no deal situation, which is still possible, even though it's unlikely on the 31st of October, more of those traders will know what they have to do to get to that border on day one, not just on in week mm. three, in order to get across the border um, without any hold-ups. So I can absolutely understand what the government is doing, um, but you'll have to ask the government, not me, because I'm not part of it anymore. OK. <laughs> I'll let you go. Thank Philip, you. thank you very much for coming. Let's go to some questions um, before I monopolise everything in the time. So if anyone... 
has got any questions, if anyone's in the next door, if Roman wants to ask anything, do remember to pop <coughs> your head in and we'll take, uh, take questions in uh, groups of three. We've got roving mic there, so Lewis right to the back and then Jess there. Yes, and tell us who you are. Um, hello, my name's Joy Ladico. Um, I'm a journalist. Um, were I to subscribe to the Dominic Cummings as a genius school, I would say it was a brilliant idea of him to leak this uh, document to the Sunday Times in the first place, in that it would bring the public, you know, make the public and businesses focus on what was going to go wrong and soften MPs to any deal that did arrive. I don't actually subscribe to that school. I subscribe to the idea that it will have been somebody who, almost in an act of desperation, wanted the public to know quite how serious a no-deal situation would be. However, the government is so confident at the moment that the country backs uh, Brexit and with no deal if possible. It confuses me that they wouldn't want to actually let their very supportive public, the will of the people, want to actually know what will come of it as a consequence because surely everybody will accept it. So, Is that a question? It is, it's a statement with the question of, which unfortunately um, uh, Philip has just I'm left. Sorry about that. Um, but the very broad question is, why continue to suppress the information? Surely just get it out. Okay, um, do that, yes. Uh, Ian Corby, I guess from the other perspective, um, my question is, is anybody in the panel concerned that this will stymie um, government planning in future, as people will be very concerned about putting down on paper um, risks which by virtue of being published can become self-fulfilling prophecies. So you advertise that there's a possibility there's going to be a shortage of toilet paper and suddenly everybody's going to go out and stockpile toilet paper. So do we need to go back to what the previous Prime Minister tried, which was briefing under Privy Council terms, uh, rather than pushing this all out into the public? And Okay, let's go to those. I think it's very interesting about, uh, about transparency around planning, actually whether the UK as a nation is capable of dealing with sort of information. So, Ross, yeah. um, you obviously thought this was quite sensational. You got loads of coverage for it and managed to change the weather a bit with this, and we won't uh, discuss where you got it from, so I'm not going to ask you to, comment on, to comment on that. But I'm quite interested. I mean, you, 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 you missed the answer then, shall we? Dominic Cummings. Oh, Dominic Cummings. OK. Yeah, well, it's now on Sky News. Anyway, probably very pleased to hear that. I'm just quite interested in, in sort of what you're thinking about sort of editorially in the Sunday Times, uh, given that quite a lot of the risks here are sort of panic risks. And there's always a danger that if you sort of mix and say there's going to be a shortage of this, that I will go and fill my cupboards with it, and it becomes a bit sort of self-fulfilling. So are you sort of thinking when you're looking at these things, actually, what is in the public interest, and actually what, what might be put out there and be harmful to the public interest? Yeah, we had to be incredibly careful, particularly around medicines. Um, obviously, if you say which particular medicines there are risks of, which we can't stockpile, obviously there are a number of drugs that we can't. Um, on my story a week later was about uh, another document that looked at neurology mm. drugs, the ones that couldn't mm. be stockpiled, and prioritising them in the event of a no deal. So which ones would be given priority to get into the country? Um, and doctors were asked to do that work voluntarily, incidentally. They, they weren't paid to do it. Um, and we decided against naming any drug because there is a risk, clearly, that people would cling on to that. We're aware of that, obviously, with insulin. You can't really cover that one up. Um, I have a friend who is diabetic who is stockpiling insulin, you know, and, and they're a doctor, and I think that's a terrible situation <coughs> in which that a doctor feels that they should be having to do that. Um, so I think there are very, you know, you have to be incredibly careful with this stuff. Uh, clearly, many of these things were stories we'd already written ourselves and other papers had already written. One element of this was about social care, and the week before I'd actually done a story, and it turned out clearly that the person who had, who had brief me, had read this document and was aware of the concerns around the social care industry in the event of a no deal. So um, clearly you have to be very careful with what you're writing. Um, that said, you know, we're obviously we're not naming specific uh, medicines. Beyond that, I think there's a really important element of transparency here. I think people should be entitled to do what they can on a personal level to mitigate a problem. So Graham, one of the big holes in this plan, I'm coming on to Hillary on this, is on Northern Ireland, where basically the plan is we don't really have a plan. I think it says that it doesn't have a sustainable plan. For Northern Ireland, we've heard similar things, I think, from Karen Wheeler before the exiting 
the EU Committee, former DG Border, Border Group. You've worked a lot in Northern Ireland. The civil servants there, actually, because they're not under the control of ministers, put out some quite transparent stuff about the potential, potential sort of risk. Do you think the government should actually be prepared to come out a bit more on what its plan, what actually might happen in Northern Ireland? This you mentioned, I think, that it doesn't mention cows getting culled in your article, which was, I think, a Newsnight story, wasn't it, about mass cullings of Northern Irish cows? Yeah, I, th I thought in my article I, I added some of the biggest scare stories and yeah. I'll actually to happen. Oh, right. I thought you wanted those in as assumptions. No, no, but anyway. no, 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 I'm just saying it wasn't... So, a, it, the, the so were you what, worried by what this what, plan wasn't, says wasn't, about Northern Ireland, given it, your background in working as advisor to the yeah. First Minister? Just before I come on to that, could, could, I, could I just mention that yeah. um, I think something like 85% of British insulin mm. supplies come from a single Danish mm. company. If you go on their website, they say they've got six months stockpiles and no patients in Britain will, be a, will, will suffer from a lack of insulin, uh, whatever happens to, 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 to Brexit. Um, I don't know if the Sunday Times has reported that, but they might like to add a, a, a rider. Well, I don't have that at my fingertips, but I know there are very genuine concerns about this within the NHS. Well, there were huge concerns. Yeah, I mean, the, the NHS are very interested in this. We, we get plenty of senior doctors say, look, you know, we, we might, if we have a shortage of this, patients will suffer. But these are always conditional statements. If there's congestion at the ports, we might have shortages, and if we have shortages, patients might, might, might suffer. Well, we, we can all agree with that, but you, but you have to examine the, the start of that chain of logic. Will, will there actually be congestion at ports? Will there actually be uh, shortages? But, anyway, but if to, you're to, an ill person, that's a pretty frightening thing to... But, but it's you that's frightening them, not me. It's, it's not me who's frightening them. It's doctors talking to us and saying, I am concerned that we will yeah. not have a supply of radiology drugs, for example, because but, but, they break down. If you have any delays at the port, those drugs are, you know, irreparably damaged. You, your Sunday Times is not the worst offender at all, but mm. the, the BBC will, will virtually never ask what the evidence is. I mean, there's people on the BBC every, and the other media every day of the week saying that no, no deal will be a catastrophe. Mm. I, I don't think... I, I've, uh, sorry, I'm looking at one or two journalists here. And we have <laughs> Boris Johnson saying a lot of the negativity about a no-deal Brexit has been wildly overdone. So I think we have both sides of those opinions coming into the yeah. world with I, very little evidence I think anybody who, on one side. Anybody on the media who says no deal will be a catastrophe should be asked, what sort of catastrophe are you Im imagining? What, what, what form will it take? And what's your <coughs> evidence for that? I mean, these are simple follow-up questions. But in my experience, they're, 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 they're uh, never asked. But to come to your... Northern Ireland, I'm quite worried about Northern because Northern Ireland is clearly, you know, I mean, these are, you know, they're quite significant holders, but actually, you know, as you point out, there are lots of ports into, uh, into Great Britain and whatever, but Northern Ireland does seem a particularly acute problem and various select committees have examined yeah. the problems of no deal in Northern Ireland. Yeah, but the, there are acute problems. The, the, the worst of them actually is in dairy and big industry. Mm. And, I mean, it's, mm. it's only about 3% of output in Northern Ireland, but still a lot, a lot of farms and, uh, you know, and, and, and some of them are good, good friends of mine. Um, majority of farmers... Can you speak up, please? Yes, is, is this microphone picking up? Is it... I think you just need to be a bit louder. Oh, just a bit louder, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, do shout again if I, uh, if, if I, if I start fading away. The uh, majority of farmers in Northern Ireland actually voted for Brexit, as, as far as we, un we understand it, even, uh, even so. But there is a big problem, particularly the dairy farmers, because about a third of the liquid milk in Northern Ireland is actually processed south of the border. We've allowed that position to grow up because they, they, they offered, the southern government offered bigger <coughs> subsidies to build the processing plants. Uh, and if we do have no deal, we're, we're going to have to start building more stainless steel, as they call it, processing uh, plant in Northern Ireland. But nevertheless, that, 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 that would take some time to do. So th there would be a, a problem on day one here. that This milk, if it goes south of the border, might face tariffs of 40%, and then any butter coming back might 40% coming back. So it might kill the, the, the trade. Although the, there are exemptions in the EU for inward and outward processing so that you don't have to pay the tariffs. But anyway, let, let, let's imagine the EU won't even play ball on that. So the worst possible case here is that farmers will have to dry off their cows, as, as they say. They'll have to lower the feeding regimes to produce less milk. And in the worst possible case, they'll have to cull some cows. And so Biddy Phillips still isn't here because I, I know some of his colleagues have been looking closely at this, what it would take. They're talking to the Treasury about how farmers would be compensated uh, for this. So th th there are worse cases. 
that farmers uh, and other producers won't, won't suffer. Uh, Hillary mentioned sheep farmers, which is by, by far the worst sector in agriculture as far as no deal is concerned. The estimate across the UK as a whole is that most agricultural sectors will gain uh, from less imports from the south. Prices will go up, production will go up. But lamb uh, is clearly the exception. But then sheep farmers, lamb farmers, are, their incomes are very highly subsidised already, particularly in the uh, hill farming uh, areas. And what we'd have to do there is take that subsidy to their incomes up from some, whatever it is, 80% up to 100%. So you start talking about quite big amounts of money here, you know, perhaps getting into hundreds of millions. But two and a half million billion has been put aside uh, for this planning. We just have to do, do those sort of things. Could I just very quickly take up one point that Hillary made, which, which is a very common thing. That it's, un it's unprecedented for a government to do something that it knows would cause damage. Well, I'm old enough to remember Mrs. Thatcher putting up interest rates in the, in the teeth of a recession in 1980 caused the biggest, by far the deepest, post-war recession. They knew that would be the case, but they thought it was a short-term measure worth doing for long-term gain. We, 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 we can judge whether that's correct or not. The other, yeah. thing, the, the, the other thing Hillary <coughs> seems to forget is we've just gone through 10 years of austerity. Did the government not think that would damage the UK economy? Of course they didn't. Governments are always doing things that, that may involve short-term pain, but they do it because they think in the long term it's, it's a good idea. We're exactly the same in, in Brexit. Yeah. Pardon? Peter. Peter. No, it's, it's Peter, no one can hear you if you sort of bit, it's, office, uh, they're not picking you up. So uh, you can ask a question next time around. Hillary, uh, the hole in the plan, what are, you, what are you sort of worried about in terms of holes in this plan? Are you worried about the Northern Ireland piece? What particularly concerned you when you when you read this? Was there well, I'm, I'm thought... worried about all of the bits, and I'm, I'm grateful to Graham for pointing out previous follies of previous Conservative governments, so, and I didn't mean to be unfair to their, their record. Look, um, <laughs> so I, 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 I knew he would do that cheap shot, by the way. So there we are. Well, right, okay. anyway, trying but to fine, anyway. Rather than uh, old battles. By the way, just going back to the gentleman's yeah. question, then yeah. I shall come yeah. to what you said about... Privy Council briefings. Yeah. Oh, well, we were invited to a yeah. Privy Council briefing and we met the excellent team from mm. the Civil Contingency mm. Secretariat and they laid out a lot of the potential mm. consequences that now appear in the Yellowhammer document. And when we said, so what are you doing to mitigate this? They said, unfortunately, we're not permitted by ministers to answer any questions about what we're doing. And so you had a lot of quite senior politicians, a number <coughs> of former cabinet ministers sitting there very grumpy, thought, well, that was a complete waste of time. Um, second point, businesses have kind of worked out for themselves it's bad news. Mm. Now, you asked mm. the question um, earlier, Jill, you know, what's the select committee heard? Well, we ran a, a series of evidence sessions and we had a range of business organisations representing great British success stories. And my opening question is, no deal Brexit, you know, what's it mean to you? Now, they could have said, greatest thing ever, can't wait, but that's not what any of them said. I mean, the NFU has described a no-deal Brexit as catastrophic. Now, OK, it's one thing to have a pop at the papers and the BBC and opposition politicians, but could you please explain why those who are advocating no-deal as a policy know so much better about the potential consequences than people who make stuff, export stuff, for a living? Make UK described it as an act of economic vandalism. And you can read in our latest report what all of the representatives of industrial sectors had to say. And let's be honest about this, it's quite difficult for big listed companies to get up and announce that we're potentially heading for damage. So business organisations, representative bodies, the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, for example, has been very direct and is it going to have a damaging consequence on the British car manufacturing industry? Well, of course it is. 10% tariffs. Never mind when you get into rules of origin, how many of those who export to the EU and who don't export elsewhere know where to go and get the appropriate rules of origin certification for a product? So, Henry, so, so the final uh, thing I would say is the argument for getting this out there 
and it's, I think it's mm. important why Parliament was right mm. to ask for it and why the Sunday mm. Times was right to publish it, is people do need to plan if the government insists on going ahead with this policy. Sorry. I was just going to say, though, um, <coughs> we're quite interested, go, just going back to you, know, you've been in you know, departments that do contingency planning, DEFRA, where you know, we had lots of potential disasters on our whatever, them putting in places of mitigation. Do you think that you know, government generally should be prepared to be much more open about its risk, <coughs> risk planning? And can we educate the public to understand what we're doing when we do that? Because that seems to me to be one of the sort of problems. No, I think this is a, a very important but a very difficult question. Um, I sat on MISC 33 when I was a cabinet minister, and that was looking at preparation for human pandemic <coughs> flu. And it was probably the scariest thing I did during my time as a cabinet minister um, because it really opened your eyes to the potential consequences for society of a breakdown in the way in which we expect things to run. Because you can calculate, you could say the infection rate is this. So on any given day, 5% of primary school teachers won't be present in school and 5% of children. Believe you me, the moment that fit mm. human beings start dying of human pandemic mm. flu, no one is going mm. to send their child mm. to school. Well, I wouldn't. Mm. So um, it was really important that we mm. did that because one of the consequences, we decided to buy a load of Tamiflu. Now that can mitigate the severity of the symptoms. And we decided to pre-order a vaccine at great expense. Because, as I remember saying in the Cabinet mm. Subcommittee, do any of us want to be sitting here when someone says, you saw all of this, mm. why didn't you order, pre-order the vaccine? So we decided mm. we were going to order the vaccine. Now, it is a really good question, Jill, to what extent you should share all of that uh, with the public, partly because you don't know exactly what's going to happen mm. depending on uh, the consequences. But prudent government um, does require you to guard against these contingencies what requires you to have done the planning and then you have to make a judgment as a government or a minister about how much you put in the public domain when depending on how likely you think it is to happen when you go back to perhaps the most alarming case of all when the government decided to issue to every household in the country a copy of that booklet protect and survive does anyone remember that which told you what to do in the event of a nuclear attack now um, the government at that time decided it was probably a sensible thing to do. Joe, quickly. Uh, yeah, on the uh, final questions. I mean, the Sorry. reason you have to publish these assumptions, I think it's worrying it's taken so long, is because it's very different to the flu scenario in that it's not just up to the government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the customs brokers, the freight mm -hmm. forwarders, the ports, these are all private companies. If they mm -hmm. don't know what they're supposed to prepare mm -hmm. for, then the fundamental people mm -hmm. who have to be ready don't know what they're getting ready for. And that was probably the worriest thing, the most worrying thing I thought was that the Freight Transport Association came out mm. when the assumptions came out and said, oh, this isn't what we'd heard. This isn't what government had told us. And they're mm. obviously fundamental mm. parts of actually being <coughs> ready yep. for the border. I think the thing that needs mm. to then, you know, that is missing in publication terms is actually the mitigations. What's more mm. interesting is what is government doing about this? Mm. As Philip said, you know, there are like 17,000 officials mm. working on Brexit. A lot of them are on no mm. deal work. We don't know. I mean. Um, Michael Gove says 300 projects, 600 milestones. We don't know if they're red, amber, green, whether we should be worried about certain areas or not. And in the same way that Major Projects Authority publishes a report every year of the biggest, scariest projects in government, the, the Major Projects portfolio, <clears throat> I think there's one Brexit project on there because it was on there already, the custom system. We don't actually know of these projects, what's on track, what will be ready by October 31st, and what won't, and what that means. Okay, I'm going to take final questions because you've all been incredibly forbearing, <coughs> but I don't want to make sure. I can have lots of questions. Anyway, um, okay, so we've got uh, Jess, we'll go over here, and Lewis right to the back, and we will do so one line as if you possibly can, and then I'll go down the panel and ask them to take anything they can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, should we not be concerned about continued editions of Ben Burt bills or the like? Uh, almost undermining readiness for if we, we do finally get to the point of no deal and there's a sort of business weariness about continued preparation and nothing happening. So, so I missed the first part. I think you're Sorry. making no deal worse because... Uh, no, I wouldn't say that, but um, <laughs> would, should we not be concerned that 
readiness might be undermined by kind of continuing to extend and then okay. continue to warn. Okay, so we'll just take these down. Yeah. Yes. Yep, there. Angela Pover, I'm a cattle farmer from Cornwall, and um, I would just urge the panel to be cautious when you cite that you have spoken to trade associations, because in Cornwall, the farmers don't, uh, well, they, when we, we have our officials from the NFU come and speak to us, they basically leave the room with their tails between their legs because we are really waiting for a no-deal Brexit in Cornwall for farming community. And I also heard you mention the, um, uh, the Transport Trade Association. If the um, government actually went and spoke to some of these organisations such as TNT or FedEx, and spoke to their directors and their managers, I think you'll find a different view, that they are absolutely ready. They are very clever people that work for the transport industry. They wouldn't be approaching um, the, the, the end of October without having an idea of what they were going to do. So I just urge that on the panel That's when you, you cite trade associations speaking on behalf of industries. Okay, that's very interesting. And um, some more potential witnesses for the exiting the EU committee. Yes. Hi, um, Ros Boyle, Ernst and Young. Um, one for Hillary. Um, you said in your um, spiel that um, there was a high correlation between the likelihood of something happening and how much it's put into the public domain. Do you think this is what's happening in the government now, that they think there's a low possibility of Brexit being a no deal and hence why they've not released enough information on it? Yes, and go... Lewis there and Jess there? Oh, anyway, Lewis <laughs> there. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. Hi, Just Mia Hunt. Pick everybody up. Um, since Brexit, we've, we've often seen ministers claim that the civil service assessment of the risks around Brexit has been overblown. Um, is there a feeling within the civil service that negative advice will not be welcomed by ministers? And, um, and what are the risks of ignoring or undermining advice? Okay, and yes. Hello, Jacob. Uh, I'd like to ask where civil society is in all the planning. So the people running the food banks, people dealing with the daily, daily problems which we all have from social care and things like that. Um, as food banks are on the last legs at the moment and if there's no food they'll be struggling too. Yeah. And finally, lady down here, Lewis. Uh, Anita Punwani, Risk Advisor. A fundamental part of uh, effective risk management is assigning responsibility. If in the months after uh, we leave uh, in November, there are um, a number of deaths uh, as a re direct result of, of Brexit, where will responsibility lie? Okay, that's a very comprehensive, comprehensive set. So um, I think very useful voice. Um, say that actually no trade association represents all voices are very variegated ones. Uh, I know in some cases government ministers have thought that trade associations are taking a different line from businesses, but there's partly, in some cases, because as Hilary said, some businesses are a bit concerned about fronting up to, up to government, but uh, it's always good and you need to make sure that you're getting your name on the list to give evidence to select committees and putting in your evidence so that they pick that up too. So we've got Hilary, the question to you, uh, are, is your act undermining readiness by actually this continual extension, you know, people sort of planning the 31st of October, but it might be the 31st of January, or it might not happen? Is that a risk? Because it clearly complicates the communication quite a bit. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Or are you just taking it off the table? Definitively? Well, if you think, and I do, and a majority of MPs do, the no deal is something we do not support. We do not think it's in the national economic interest. It could have the consequences we spent the last hour discussing. Then, uh, and Parliament has told the government it's not happening. Um, yes, I can see why that would lead some people to conclude, well, do we really need to bust a gut to get ready? Because um, it's not going to get through um, Parliament. But if you think it's the wrong thing, then that's not an argument for not legislating to prevent it, which is what happened in the uh, European Union Withdrawal Number 2 Act that is now on uh, the statute book. I accept entirely the point uh, you make, Madam, about different people have different views about Brexit. That's why we're in 
the mess uh, that we are. And we've certainly had evidence from people who said, we think it's going to be terrific. Um, it's very hard to speak and take evidence from every farmer, every car manufacturer, every pharmaceutical firm. And so, of course, select committees are drawn to representative organisations um, whose job it is to express a view on behalf of their members. Um, the point our colleague over there made, um, one of the striking things about the document was it talked about the impact on low-income families. And Michael Gove himself has said there will be food price rises. And the document says there will be an increase in electricity prices in Northern Ireland. Well, that is going to impact most, of course, on people and families who are on low incomes. Um, finally, well, look, the responsibility for the consequences, whatever they are, rests with the people who advocated the policy. I think there's an interesting thing about who will be held responsible if there are sort of breakdowns in in these plans. I know Philip has uh, has quite strong concerns about this. Joe, do you get the impression the question that we had about uh, about the uh, whether the civil <coughs> service feels that negative advice is unwelcome? What are you picking up from civil servants about the sort of change in attitudes since we have the new administration? So, on the the point of no deal um, in particular. It's Michael Gove who sits at the top of it. He has been immersed in this stuff at DEFRA, and actually DEFRA are the most affected and are probably the first department that tilted to say, we're just going straight out and preparing for no deal because that is the best way to prepare. Um, and actually, from being on the receiving end of some of the problems that Philip mentioned around secrecy uh, in government between departments and failing to get cross-government decisions, I think you know people we spoke to say he's actually made a positive difference in terms of mm. preparation by trying to say we need to cut down this secrecy, mm. we need to start mm. making these key decisions. So in that sense, I think he's already seen the warts and all. So I don't think there'll be concerns for him. Obviously, with new sets of ministers, particularly you know I can imagine, for example, uh, the people in Treasury after Graham's comments were concerned about who their new minister would be. The people in the business department mm. with the reputation they got might have been concerned with Andrea Lettum. Mm. But this, you know. This is the kind of um, the process they have to go through. The challenge is that there is so much, so little time to kind of build a shared understanding with new ministers uh, and kind of, to use the term, bring them on the journey. On the point around um, uh, transport is a very valid point, and I think you're right that you know some of the firms have really mm. pulled their act together. One of the big mm. concerns with transport and logistics firms going through Dover Calais is that two thirds of the firms are EU logistics firms. And a lot of businesses on the UK side are worried that if they think that they, they will be sending lorries over to then sit in queues for a day, they'll stop accepting UK jobs. Mm. And that could have a knock on to just capacity that runs mm. through the Dover Calais. So I do accept that there are some areas we've done and some parts of transport and logistics that have done much more, but we are very reliant on EU providers for logistics. And actually some of the changes in rules about where you can pick up and drop off and cabotage rights means that the UK is a less attractive proposition mm. to do business with. When we rely so heavily of them, on them, that can be quite a big concern. Mm. Graham, I want to come to you with this sort of question uh, on uh, uh, assigning responsibility. Because obviously, the people who have been relatively relaxed about a no-deal Brexit are obviously the people who, <coughs> uh, who may find themselves in the sort of... Um, uh, firing line maybe isn't quite right, but you know, people will be saying, you know, look, you, know, you have inflicted that. And I think it's probably true that almost anything that goes wrong over the winter will be the fault of somebody and we will be into the world's most massive blame game. Uh, is there anything you think that we could do now to stop just a sort of winter of recriminations if that happens? No, of course not. Really. You, you'll get huge recriminations. Everybody will blame everything on Brexit as they already do, really. I mean, that's what we're, we're, so you're we're just relaxed about that. You as Hillary the, said, we're yeah. a divided nation and, and all, all sorts of stuff is going to be thrown around. But it was a very interesting mm -hmm. question. Look, yeah. if people die, who's, yeah. who's to blame? Well, if people die, let, let's have an inquiry to see who actually was to, to blame. I mean, if they died because insulin mm. supplies weren't coming through, why weren't mm. insulin supplies coming mm. through? What, what, what exactly uh, happened? I don't think there'll be much in the way of congestion at ports. I don't think there'll be shortages of anything. I don't think anybody will, 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 will die. But if things go badly wrong uh, and something does happen, let's, let's find out why and apportion blame you know, accordingly. 
Um, one of the uh, charities, I, I won't say which because I don't have their permission to, but has asked the um, has asked the Department of Health and Social Care this repeatedly. Um, are you recording one of the health charities? Are you re do you have any system of recording any deaths that have happened? They uh, have not had an answer. They say that the Department of Health and Social Care has said it doesn't. It's not going to do that at the moment. I mean that could all change. But um, I had a conversation with them two weeks ago on that, so that's pretty current. Um, so that isn't isn't a plan, and, and clearly I think there will be a push for that to be a plan. And what about this question here about sort of actually putting things, you know, the sort of relationship between likelihood of something happening and putting things into the public <coughs> public domain? Well, I thought one of the really important parts right at the top mm. of this document was it talked about EU exit fatigue, mm. which obviously we've talked mm. about a lot. You know, people are prepared now for the mm. 31st. They prepare for the April exit didn't happen. Mm. They're now preparing for this third, which mm. may or may not happen. And so I think the more information you have, the better, because people are, are not, you know, they're thinking, well, hang on, this didn't happen twice before we put all this energy and money right. into preparing for it. So I, I don't really take that. I think it's helpful that there's a, an element of, uh, well, greater transparency around it. So actually the government got a lot of free publicity from your uh, front page I don't page think they saw it like that. Rather than, uh, uh, rather than invest the hundred, we could save the hundred million. It wasn't quite what they were saying on the Sunday morning, <laughs> uh, no. Could I give one, one quick example yeah. of, of secrecy? I, I spent most of the afternoon in Dexu on the alternative <coughs> arrangements committee. We, we were locked in a room until we could read papers, but we weren't allowed to take them out. And so on. And the main paper was a, was a statistical account of trade in Northern Ireland. I thought, well, look, I know most of this, and you can look it up on the web. So I said, well, what, why? And it was stamped on every page, uh, government sensitive. I said, well, what is sensitive about public yeah. trade certificate? And they said, oh, well, they, they said that there's a case study at the end that, that, and it was a paragraph, that mentions a company. He thought, well, take that out yeah. and publish publish the rest. I mean, is, is, is this a system which has yeah. which, which just gone crazy about secrecy? I, I mean, think that silly. is actually one of the points that has been a repeated theme in IFG reports <laughs> is actually that a lot of the planning has been hampered. Um, I'm going to draw it to close there. I'm sorry we've slightly run over even our extended deadline, um, but that's a Brexit metaphor for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for your forbearance and whatever. Uh, there should be drinks outside, but could you first just thank our fantastic panel?